Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to the uh, second forum of the Box Valley Sustainability Network. My name is Gary Panin, from Seven Generations Ahead. And uh, on behalf of the Box Valley Sustainability Network 14, I welcome all of you uh, to Two Brothers Brewing Company. I can't think of a better place to be <laughs> on a beautiful day uh, in the afternoon than here. Um, and uh, to get things started, we've asked Jim Abel, uh, co-founder along with his brother, Two Brothers uh, Brewing Company, to just give us a few words of welcome. So Jim, welcome to the podium. Thanks. Thanks. That doesn't work very well. Who planned this? <laughs> a drinking establishment, nonetheless. Uh, well, welcome, everybody. Uh, uh, my name is Jim Abel, and I um, helped found Two Brothers Brewing Company with my brother Jason. Uh, just about 20 years ago, it'll be 20 in October, somehow already that happened. Time flies. Um, but I just wanted to uh, thank everybody for coming out. You know, since we started, we've always been very conscientious about our energy use. And being a brewery uh, is extremely energy inefficient. Um, we are hogs. And so from the very beginning, we've worked hard to come up with uh, better ways using new technology uh, to save that energy, or at least a good portion of it, recycle it. Um, so often when we're, we're, we're heating things and we need to cool, we're able to recapture a lot of that heat energy um, to use in other places in the brewery. And as we've gotten into uh, restaurants, we've been very interested in um, composting. We do hold a zero waste festival um, it's held right here in Aurora. It was last weekend, if anybody happened to go to our summer festival. Um, but for the last four years, that's been a zero waste event. We uh, coordinate with a commercial composter, use all compostable uh, materials, and don't allow any, uh, any other even recyclables into the event. Um, so those kind of things, buying green energy, really important to us. Um, and we're always looking to improve and I think that's why we're probably all here, that there's always new alternatives for us as we look further into energy savings and uh, you know, more commercial composting opportunities and things like that. So uh, welcome, thanks very much for coming. Um, I hope you guys can stay afterwards and sample some of our beers or food. Uh, you know, we're very organically driven here as far as food goes. Um, and with that, I think, Stephanie might come up and say a quick word. So thanks again. Have fun. Thank you. I just wanted to welcome everybody to Aurora and to uh, our second forum of the Fox Valley Sustainability Network um, and to the Two Brothers Brewery. And it is my pleasure to introduce uh, Mayor Tom Weisner. He is in his third term in office. And throughout his entire administration, sustainability has been a strong pillar and a guiding principle of everything that we have done um, with all the growth. And he's going to talk a little bit about that. But in addition to being a local leader, he's also a regional leader um, serving on the, the board of CMAP, uh, the Illinois Municipal League, Chicago Metropolitan Mayor's Caucus. And I think he'll talk a little bit about his work with the Northwest Water Planning Alliance. Uh, so with that, I'll introduce Mayor Tomlin. Thank you, Stephanie. That was probably one of the most mercifully brief introductions that I've had in a while, and I thank you for that, as does the entire audience. Uh, and I, you know, I think Jim Abel doesn't realize that I've been an important contributor uh, to, the, to the zero waste effort here uh, at Two Brothers Roundhouse. Uh, I have never left a drop of domain paid uh, in my beer glass in any time I've ever been here. Uh, and I've also, talking about zero waste, I've also, I'd like to say also that I've never really been wasted here. <laughs> we'll just leave it at that. Okay. So anyway, I want to welcome all of you here, all of you who are uh, dedicated to sustainability. You are more than welcome in this town because we are dedicated to the same uh, purpose. Uh, and uh, we've enjoyed, our, I, I certainly as mayor have enjoyed my ride for 11 plus years now, and I think it was back in 2008, not too long after I was elected the first time, 
that we had our first uh, Green Town conference. Um, and uh, I think Gary, and I think seven generations ahead uh, was involved back then. Uh, and that was when we were behind. And now we're generations ahead in terms of sustainability of where, where we once were. Uh, and uh, most recently, oh, first I need to, before I forget, invite you to our Green Fest, uh, which will take place on Route 31 in Illinois Avenue, just across the river, uh, this Saturday. And it probably starts off what, about 10 a.m. 10 a.m. Starts at 10 a.m. Uh, and it's, got, it's, it's a volunteer effort, uh, and it's grown every year. It's pretty extensive, and so we'd love to have you uh, visit that. This weekend, you have, have the possibility, uh, and that's been that's kind of the capstone for a month of a lot of sustainability-related uh, activities that we had um, more recently. Uh, a water forum, uh, we refer to it as, uh, after the 2040 um, water planning thing that went on at CMAP for about two years. Uh, myself and. gentleman who went with me, uh, Pete Wallers, uh, with EI and engineer, we were like, okay, what happens now? We finished two years of planning and talking and discussion, and then it was just kind of over. We said, well, why don't we look at starting kind of a sub-regional water planning group on a permanent basis? So we began Northwest Water Planning Alliance, which is uh, five counties that are involved in 80-some communities within those five counties. And we held our first water forum right here uh, on May 12th and talked about uh, what's going on with our water supply in this part of Illinois. And there are a lot of things to be concerned about. Uh, and typically what we see is governments and people alike uh, think that there's an infinite supply of uh, water uh, in, in our area. And that it not only is it infinite, but it should be very cheap uh, as well. Uh, things are changing. Uh, deep aquifers are severely threatened. This area. We're seeing uh, infiltration of salt chlorides into our shallow aquifers. We're beginning to see that. And, uh, there's quite a bit of buildup behind that that we haven't seen yet, that I'm sure quite certain we will. We have a number of major issues that we have to work together uh, to uh, uh, take, make, make sure that in the future our children and their children uh, don't have a problem with uh, clean drinking water uh, in this area. We need to work together to do that because I think we, a lot of communities think that whatever they do only affects them. What they do affects their neighbors. Uh, and I can cite as far away as Joliet, uh, what they're doing with the deep aquifers that they share with many of us is creating many, many problems for other communities. Uh, not, not 20 years from now, but a year from now. So uh, the other event we had recently was the uh, opening of the uh, protected bike trail uh, that we installed in our downtown. It uh, was once the only gap in a 40 mile long bike trail along the Fox River that went all the way up to El Grande and all the way down to wherever. Was that? Oswego. Uh, and um, we uh, took care of that with a nice protected bike trail in downtown. We just celebrated that. We have a number of uh, uh, bike trail projects on the boards for this year. And uh, we just uh, last, uh, last night uh, pre approved, basically, we'll vote on next week the council on uh, a tollway bridge uh, over I 88 at Farnsworth, which will be one of the first tollway bridges, if not the first, that will have a bike ped segment uh, across, across the tollway. And that was an innovation that we were able to work out with uh, the, uh, the tollway board. Uh, I, I believe that they'd be the first one yet of its kind. So we're continuing to press along on the sustainability issues. Uh, probably have more rain gardens than any place but Chicago in the state of Illinois. Uh, and we're proud of what we're doing. And I, what I find most fascinating, I got quoted in the video the other day saying that when I started talking about sustainability, 11 years ago, people would just kind of look at me like, I was a weirdo, you know, and they might have been partially right, but well, the fact was that it was not in vogue in Aurora at that time. And what I'm delighted about is not only that we've made a lot of advances, but that our own citizens 
are very proud of, of what we've accomplished and what we're doing. And that's, that's the best feeling in the world. So you, I welcome you here. Uh, you're welcome anytime. And hopefully, I'll be, I've got to run, but hopefully we'll get back and share a beer with you. Thank you very much. He's, he's run out the door, but it was uh, probably a beer here at Two Brothers, and one, one in which you didn't leave a drop, that we began to have a conversation about the development of the Fox Valley uh, Sustainability Network. And um, the, uh, the, the, um, uh, the network, uh, just by way of a really brief history, uh, is, is a collaboration of Kane County government, uh, the city of Aurora, uh, A5 branding and digital, and seven generations ahead, along with many partners, communities in the Fox Valley. And um, it was prior to the development of the 2015 Greentown event that we had a conversation with Mayor Wisner, and he had expressed interest in pulling together communities in the Fox Valley to do exactly what he just said, uh, to really look outside of the communities, to look regionally, and begin to think about solutions problems that were affecting all the communities in the Fox Valley. And this is really how this got born. We held the Greentown event back in 2015, right here in February. And, uh, and then as part of that event, we had a conversation about developing a network. And it's literally taken, it, taken us about a year. We pulled together an advisory committee. And, uh, and that committee has met over the past year to develop what is now the, the emerging Fox Valley Sustainability Network. So as has been said, this is our second forum. I want to talk a little bit, just briefly, about some of our goals. The big idea is to really get communities to collaborate across communities, across institutions. Um, we're really focused on two major things. One, how can we support existing projects and initiatives that are already on the ground, that people are working on, and just get uh, communities in the Fox Valley to do whatever they can to help push those initiatives and projects forward. And secondly, can we use this as, a, as an incubator, as, a, as a, a form in which we think big, uh, develop big ideas, and develop some project teams so that we can actually um, you know, move the needle on some of the core topic areas that we're going to be talking about today in the discussion groups. And, um, and then lastly, um, you know, to really make everyone aware of existing programs and resources that are out there that every community can to be able to move forward their own sustainability agendas. So that's uh, the, the really the key goal. Uh, today, we're going to focus a lot, uh, and this is really the development of a conversation that we had at our last advisory committee meeting. Uh, the decision was made to, let's, let's do for each forum, and we're going to do four a year, um, and uh, for this year, and then next year we'll, we'll sit back and, and reevaluate. But uh, for this particular forum, and maybe the next one's moving forward, why don't we focus on a singular theme? Uh, today is community solar. And, uh, but then retain our structure of having our seven topic area groups so that we can continue to support the existing initiatives across those topic areas. And then, um, you know, hopefully develop some new big idea projects that we can be working on in between the forums. Um, when we, we're still in the process of, of getting our funding together, um, for the broader initiative, when we do that, we're hoping to have an, an every other year Greentown event. Uh, we're hoping to have a uh, mayor's breakfast and, um, and really to be able to support on the ground project development and implementation uh, moving forward. So that's sort of the, the top level overview. Um, before we move on to our, our first speaker, I do, do want to thank Applied Ecological Services and Public Services and Kane County Government for their sponsorship of this event. Um, we are funding this, this uh, event through um, private and, and government and, and nonprofit sponsorships in addition to seeking grant funding. And so we're always looking for that kind of support. It, it helps us to, to pay for your water and all the expensive things that we're providing here. Uh, that was a joke. And, um, <laughs> we did have food at our last venue. But um, it really does help to support the overall um, implementation of the network. So, um, and, and we're going to hear from Kaylee later on, but you can see that there's a lot of uh, social media that we're beginning to do. A5 Brand Digital is taking the lead on that. And uh, we'll hear 
more ways to connect um, unless you understand what's on the we wrap it there and you can just kind of click in right now as we move forward. So I want to invite Cecilia Gilbert to come up and who's going to introduce our first uh, speaker, Cecilia. King County Environmental Division. I don't want to touch this. <laughs> uh, it's my pleasure to introduce our first speaker for this first portion of our uh, agenda today. <laughs> Thank you. We have a doctor in the house. Nobody gets that joke yet. <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm sorry. So, uh, Introducing our first speaker, uh, Steve Johnson is a principal and VP of business development for Convergence Energy, uh, a solar developer based in Lake Geneva, Wisconsin that was founded in 2009. And Convergence, Convergence develops projects in the commercial, industrial, and municipal markets, uh, including developing the first community solar project in Wisconsin. So Steve's uh, short presentation today is titled Intelligent Solar, the Next Generation of Solar Power. Let's welcome Steve Johnson. Doctor, you want to come back up here? No. <laughs> Steve, thank you, Gary. Appreciate it. Um, as I said, they said I'm Steve Johnson, Convergence Energy. Uh, we are a solar developer. I'm going to take you through how solar can work in markets where electricity is uh, inexpensive. And whether you believe it or not, that is Illinois. One of the major reasons that solar really hasn't taken off like it has in 14, 16 other states around the United States is because electricity is so expensive. So a few years ago, uh, we uh, found a way to monetize uh, storage assets, in other words, batteries, combined with solar and software to create a business case that we call intelligent solar. And that allows both commercial, uh, municipal, and industrial customers participate in solar where they might not normally be able to because the financial or economic side of it doesn't work. The residential side is coming, but you have to aggregate large quantities of solar installations in order to play in some of the wholesale power market revenue streams that are coming from it. So I hope that this isn't too complicated. I'm going to try and keep it fairly high level in this, in this talk. This just gives you a little idea of who we are. Um, the top picture that you see up there shows some of the projects that we've done. We design, engineer, finance, and construct projects, um, primarily in Wisconsin and Illinois. We've done things in Ohio and in Colorado. Um, we work in government, residential, and commercial, and we built, as uh, Cecilia said, the first uh, community solar farm in Wisconsin. And it might have been one of the first community solar farms in the United States. We started the process in 2009, and it happened by chance. We're, as we said, we're from Lake Geneva, and there are a lot of folks that live on the lake that have a lot of money, but they don't necessarily have an environment that would be conducive to solar. In other words, you want to have a good southern-facing environment. You don't want any shade trees. Um, you might not be able to put solar on your home system. We'd love to have solar. How can we do it? We found the same case in um, folks that have airplane hangers and they want to put solar on their hangar. They live in a condominium. They have an apartment. They'd like to participate. So we uh, came up with this idea that we call network solar. And what we did is we leased 14 acres of farmland in rural uh, Gallupin, Wisconsin, about 14 miles northwest of Lake Geneva. And we went through conditional use permitting for the county of Walworth and got them to allow us to take this 14 acres and put um, 660 kW of solar array on that. That's the picture that you can see down there with the sunflower. For the sustainability of the food group there, we put sunflowers up there, we crushed those sunflowers, we made sunflower oil, we used that to, the, the farmer used that to till his crops on his farm there. And then we had bees there as well. We put down one hive, and pretty soon we had two, and then they added 13 because there was so much activity in the field. We haven't done that since then because it's a three-year crop, so anyway. Anyway, 47 different investors have participated in this solar farm and sold out within a year and a half of us starting it. And from there on, started to see some community solar projects taking off around the United States. We're not saying we're the smart guys, we're just saying we, we did it as a result of customers wanting to participate in solar. Illinois has, right now in front of the legislatures, is 
statute that the ICC, the Commerce Commission has said, go, you know, we can develop a community solar projects so that you don't have to put solar on your home. You can participate with a private um, developer and have your solar be on the farm field or somewhere else so that it doesn't fit in your home and you can net meter off of your bill. This isn't happening anytime soon because I don't see that the Springfield has figured out how to come to a budget, which this is part of some of the other green initiatives that are going on down in Springfield right now. The point is, is that these types of things are happening all over the United States, and it looks like Illinois is going to follow suit. Right now, Illinois is, is the largest untapped solar market in the country. And so there's great opportunity. A lot of people say, well, it's just not about solar, resource, sun. It's not true. There's plenty of sun anywhere in the United States, except perhaps Alaska, and one little corner of upper Washington. So that's what we're doing there. Um, flip the page. So what is intelligent solar? It's solar on your rooftop or on the ground. Um, it's an energy storage device that uh, it's a battery. And in the case of two projects that we're working on right now in Illinois that are finished, one in St. Charles, which will be a large ground-mounted solar array and a container of lithium-ion batteries. And we're working on another project at North Central College in Naperville that just came to contract. It's a 500 kW array on their um, rep Press Rec Center and a 250 kW battery. What that means, 500 kW, you probably go, what's that? That's 1,600 solar panels on a rooftop, and it's an eight by 10 foot container, air conditioned, fire suppression, it's got the battery. That battery is gonna be used to create a revenue stream from the grid operator. So you got ComEd, above ComEd, you have the grid operator. They have to keep the power quality, they have to keep our lights on, they have to keep circuits from blowing, transformers from blowing, and they use, um, currently they use gas-fired uh, turbines across the United States to do that. They just recently started taking on what they call fast response batteries, because batteries can respond really quickly to the changes. They can take power off the grid and put it on instantaneously. So that's what we're doing as far as, you know, the intelligent solar side goes. Our, our software is run by Intelligent Generation, which is a small Chicago software as a service company. And they have two projects done, installed, and operating right now. Ours will be the next two here in Kane County, well, Page and Kane. And we've got about 30 megawatts of projects like that in our pipeline right now that we're developing. So um, what does it do? You know, if you look at you know, the different items in, as far as solar and our energy stack or the revenue side of it or saving, you can save on energy in, uh, on your electric bill with conventional solar. And that's about it. You can save on an industrial or commercial basis demand charges, because everybody has a certain amount of their bill, as far as businesses go, that are related to demand. And solar during certain times will offset that very hard to monetize. But what intelligent solar does is it provides savings from energy, capacity, and if I'm, you know, I, I can explain any of this a little bit later if anybody wants to corner me. It also um, can you know, take care of things on the demand side. And again, I talked about the fast response frequency regulation market. That's where the bulk of the revenue comes from. And then the battery is there for resiliency. In other words, we can, we can shut down. A great example is um, plastics industry injection molding. If, if they have a flip in their um, injection molding process, whatever in that mold is ruined, and they have to shut down one of our potential client has four molders going, when it goes down, it's $2,000 and two and a half hours to clean it out. So with the inverters that convert electricity, DC to AC and from you know, the battery to the grid, you can flip that and there's no, there's instantaneous power to those machines and you won't lose that, you won't lose what's in there. Also, it can be used for critical loads in situations like Hurricane Sandy or Katrina where hospitals and all grids go down, hospitals can have large batteries in there and they can use those batteries for critical loads, lighting, elevators to evacuate people, gas stations can use these things to pump fuel. So as we start to see, you know, and everybody hears everything about Elon Musk and batteries that he's probably going to be building out in Nevada, he literally in that one little press conference dropped the cost of lithium ion batteries by 30%. So as the cost of storage comes down and solar and storage together makes a real interesting combination. Of course, it works well with wind as well. But you know, we can't produce all of our energy from wind and solar 
and expect the lights to stay on because they're intermittent power sources. So we need base load, new coal, gas, whatever they are, to take care of our base load. But as storage technology continues to develop and drop in price, you're going to see a lot more of this. So this is kind of the beginning. Um, this is how it works. You got a solar array. You got a client post up top. You got the utility down below. You got your battery storage and our software that runs it all. The software oversees how that still, how that energy is being used. <coughs> if it's used in the building, or it's used to you know charge, discharge, and go off to the grid where PJM will light you a check and monetize through the IG software platform. It's a little more complicated than that, and I, but I'm not going to go too deep on it right now. The good doctors because we probably should have flip spots, <laughs> but that's okay. You know, we'll, we'll kind of do it in a Quentin Tarantino way, you know. <laughs> so I'm going to skip this one. Let me just show you really briefly what we're talking about here. The concept is putting a network of assets across the entire country. So these little, little blue and yellow represent batteries. And when they're blue, they're charging. When they're yellow, they're discharging. So when the grid operator calls out for electricity, it can do that, and our network can hit in this area and the batteries are constantly going like this in the state of charge discharge and that's done because you can't take a battery and beat it up you know batteries aren't made to at least these batteries are not made to be totally drained and then brought back up that's really hard on them. so when you put together a network across a broad geographic area of batteries and you're controlling them with software that's connected to the grid and to our various um, locations you're able to drive a revenue model that makes solar possible in places where it normally would be. So just real quick, you know, a description of what we're talking about here today is a one megawatt you know, photovoltaic system with a, with a 1.5 megawatt ESS. So that's, you know, we'll get on that page in a moment. The client uh, remains a net consumer of electricity from the grid. They're always going to use the grid as bad as their base by some of the electricity is going to be exported which is called net metering. They buy the electricity back from you at the same rate that you buy it from them. Um, ESU's ESS, the energy storage system, is used for the, the other ancillary revenue services that I talked about, as well as backup power for systems critical loads in your building. And then the software runs it off. So if you flip the page, it tells you what, what is that, what is one megawatt, go ahead. That's like 100, one, one megawatt is in this case, 3,200 solar panels in a field that takes up about uh, four and a half, five acres of land. This is a real project that we're working on in Cook County right now. And you've got inverters, and the inverters convert the electricity from DC to AC, so it's grid compatible. Then you've got racking balances, system, permitting, installation, monitoring, interconnection, and all the stuff that you do normally. On the storage side, a one megawatt lithium ion battery is a container. It's uh, 40 feet long. You know, just like a truck container that you see on the road. Complete fire suppression, air conditioning, all of it. There's a lot of different manufacturers that are doing it. Lithium ion um, battery technology is the same as what we have in our Volts and Leafs and, uh, and the Teslas. So it's, you know, it's pretty prevalent. Um, and then it has balancing system components. It has the same type of inverter technology so that it gets it's very compatible. So that's what a, you know, an example system would look like on a commercial basis here. This would work really nicely also in a, in a, in a way that this proposal is also um, being looked at as a possible uh, extension for a community solar pilot as well. Um, next page. This just gives you a real quick idea of what this looks like from a returns point of view. So, you know, our pre-tax return IRR over 20 years is 17, 7%. And if you take it on an after-tax basis, which is kind of hard to do for an individual without knowing all the tax ramifications, but if you look at those two numbers, however you evaluate your investment, either one of those is a pretty good darn, darn good return. And a lot of people still consider solar paybacks in the 30-year range. These companies are more in the eight-year range. And I'm not sure that a lot of different companies help folks look at what's backup power work, what's that resiliency work, you know, to you as a company. It's you know hard to get a handle on. So that backup power is, is worth a lot as well. Um, at any rate, so that gives you a look. Well, bottom line results, you earn revenue from the wholesale power markets by what we do with our software partner and revenue generation. You save on your energy and power related expenses to protect critical systems and loads with your battery backup. So it's a, it's a new way of taking solar and solar technology and storage and 
put them together, create a business case that allows uh, solar to work in markets like Illinois, again, where power is so expensive. They can turn to the day. And I, I'm going to be here to Thank you, Steve. Um, I'm John Harris, A5 Branding and Digital. I do want to move this because I have an average height. I need to move this down a little bit. Um, our next speaker is a gentleman named Everton Walters. He's the president and uh, CEO of WCP Solar. They're a leading solar company here that works throughout the Chicago area in both residential and commercial projects. Um, he's a Fulbright Scholar. Uh, he earned his uh, original Bachelor of Engineering degree from the University of Technology in Jamaica, and he holds an MS and PhD from Marquette University, which does officially make him a doctor. So, <laughs> now everybody gets Cecilia's joke. <laughs> so, um, he's also a radio show host, he's an author, he's a public speaker, and he's going to talk to you for the next 10 minutes uh, ten minutes, yes, and you're going to be riveted and fascinated. Please welcome to the stage the energy doctor, Everton Walters. Thank you very much. I don't need this thing here. I like to my audience. Okay, um, first thing I want to say is that we have a big round ball in the sky called the sun. And I was told that solar doesn't work because the solar panels steal the sunlight. It steals the power of the sun. I, I, was, I was kind of surprised that somebody who was seemingly intelligent told me that. One other person told me that um, I had I installed a solar system on a residential home, and the neighbor came across and looked at the system, and was, the meter was spinning backwards. I said, wow, it's working really great. I wonder what it would behave like when there's daylight saving time. <laughs> it takes a little time to get up. <laughs> okay. That being said, Steve actually spoke about um, the next generation of solar. I want to talk about the basics of solar to get back to, so make sure everybody understands what solar is and how does it work to a degree. So let's move on to some, some solar projects that we have been doing. We have been involved in solar for quite a while, and of course, you see back to the screen. This can't be a good thing, correct? Not everybody agrees that having all those things spewing atmosphere is never a good thing. So we can move on. Um, some sample projects that we have done, I'm gonna rush through it a little bit, so we can, can, can go on. Now, we have done this project in Chicago, it's a two megawatt solar plant that's installed on the CPA, Chicago Public School District in office. It's a two megawatt solar plant, so 8,000 panels um, installed on the roof. And it works quite well around the guys save about $27,000 per month. So solar does work in Illinois. We have another one, this is in New Jersey, which is on the same latitude as we are. It's a carport mounted project, it's 435 kilowatt system. One. Then we have we're actually in the process of doing a 256 kilowatt system in, in uh, Madison in actually in um, Springfield. Right? Um, it's a carport mounted system used in some panels called cattail panels. Can we move on? Now, this is a project, it's a residential project in Illinois here, in actually in Aurora, just up by um, Springbrook. Um, so it's a, it's a five kilowatt solar project. Can we move on? Here's another type of panel, which is called a cattail panel or CDTL panel, CDTE panel. It's actually a very special all glass thin film panel that most residential seem to like because it's kind of a very sleek type of look. You can move on to the next one. This is another view of that same system. You can move on to the other one. Here is another cattail panel it's installed. And look how beautiful this looks. It reflects the sky, so it looks like a really nice picture of your home. It makes the home look like silver pants from like jewelry to your home. Basically, that's what it is. Okay, then move on. Now, we did the same project. Uh, so this is the Buffalo Globe, a 400 kilowatt project. Um, by the way, let's stop here and say Buffalo Globe is one place that I don't think I want to work with again. Their permitting process is atrocious. 
I'm in this most difficult place I've ever worked to get a permit to place, right? But this one, it, it works well, and it's, it's a 40 kilowatt system using the CDT panels, and it's so beautiful it looks from the, from the roof, right? Move on. Um, this is a ground on two megawatt project. This is also in New Jersey, so there are several projects done right across the country. Um, we do work primarily in Illinois and New Jersey, so that's more. Now, let's look at how solar works. Just a simple exercise. Now, the sun hits the panels, the panels are then produce DC power, goes to the inverter, which converts the DC into AC, which gets connected to your usage. The excess pan, the excess energy you use, goes out to the grid. That's all there is to it. It's not magic, it's not rocket science, it's a very basic, simple process. Right? So, does everybody can get a PhD in solar right now? <laughs> but it's easy, right? Let's move on. Now, does solar work in Illinois? Now, the United States is divided into six zones. And the six zones are divided by, by NASA. And in zone one is the, somewhere in the Mojave Desert, then Arizona, zone two. Illinois is, we're about in zone five. It's zone two point five, we're about in zone five. Actually, the amount of sun that hits zone, zone four, compared to zone five, is about 3% different. So therefore, Illinois is about 3% less sunlight than man. That makes sense? So, if you notice, we are, the same zone as New Jersey. And New Jersey has the highest concentration of solar in the United States. All right? Let's move on. So the, 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 this, this graph, this graphic shows the dispersion of isolation or the amount of sunlight that actually gets in the different zones. So move to the next slide. This is Germany. It looks very similar, right? But move to the next slide and show what's happening. This is Germany compared to us, because of all the sunlight that we get. Germany has the highest concentration of solar in the entire world. Last year, as a matter of fact, 50% of Germany's electricity came from solar. Compared to the amount of sunlight that we get, look at way up here, that Steve mentioned, the top part of Washington, where the light is very low. Compare this to that, and I realize that we are way more power from the sun here in Illinois than there is in most of the rest of the world. So therefore, we can do a lot more with solar than we have been doing. Right? Illinois, as you see, can in fact, can go back to you know, we can actually, where we are right here, we can do just as much or almost as much as Atlanta, Georgia, right? Marginal difference, about 1% different in terms of the amount of sunlight that they get compared to us. Move on. Now, quickly tell you about the funding processes that are available. Now, to fund solar, there are three basic methods to do that. You can buy cash, right? And not very many people have that money cash to purchase the system, right? So you can do a loan from your bank or who make the line of credit or whatever, the same as, as, same as cash, I call that. Then there's what's called the leasing, let's look at PPA first. That's called per, the Power Purchase Agreement. Power purchase agreement is one wherein they, you have an installer come in and install the system on your roof, or on your building, or on your grounds, or whatever, and then they sell you the energy that's produced by the system. You pay your energy bill to that party, who in turn will probably give you some credits towards your coming bill. There are several options that you can go with that power purchase agreement, but the basic idea is that your power supply is now coming from the sun through a cable program that you have. Typically, what happens is that at the end of the period, sometimes 20 years, the system reverts to you. So the system is owned by the, by, by the proprietor of the system for the first 20 years, and you pay them your energy bill. Usually, what they do is give you a rate that is lower than the rate that you're paying currently. Right? So if you're paying 10 cents per kilowatt hour right now, they are selling the rate maybe at 9 cents or 6 cents in this case, depending on what you negotiate with them. And then afterwards, after 20 years, you will own the system without having to pay for it. Right? So that's one way to do it. And that typically applies to commercial type solar. In the system that Steve been talking about, you do have some, re some residential solar that's coming along that scheme as well. But for the most part, it's pretty much for commercial solar. 
also for municipalities, that's a perfect match for them because one of the biggest problems with solar is that there are incentives associated with the hertz of solar, which are tax credits and depreciation, et cetera, et cetera. But most municipalities and not-for-profits don't pay the taxes. So they don't, they, don't, they don't get the incentives available. Okay? So because of that, the PP option works really great for those persons. The next option is the leasing option, which is very similar to the PPA in that you actually, you actually take a system that is owned by somebody else and you pay a fixed lease rate and you, you own all the energy and all the incentives that's available in the system. Right? Sometimes they might have variance to that, but essentially there are just these are the two major options to own solar. Now this solar is basically not including any of the battery systems that's available. You can have those included as well in terms of the PPA as well as the leasing options, but because the market is still young, it's going to take a little time to get to, get to that point where it becomes very marketable. So, right? so that basically is it. As far as WCP is concerned, we've maintained the system for at least 10 years. And we're going to cut their time's up. <laughs> you know? So any other questions before we go on? Or maybe you can talk to me afterwards if you have any questions. Okay? Thank you very much. Thank you, Doctor. Appreciate it. Um, next up, we have um, uh, Larry Katiwa uh, from uh, who's the Chief Engineer at Elevate Energy. Elevate Energy is a uh, project of the Center for Neighborhood Technology that uh, we've been working with for a number of years. They've uh, really been a, a leader both in, in energy efficiency and uh, what Larry's come to talk to us about today is uh, some of the work that Elevate is doing through the U.S. Department of Energy funded Sunshot program, and uh, Larry, it's great to have you here. Thank you. Um, so as, as you indicated, this is uh, part of the U.S. DOE's Sunshot program. That's a national grant program that DOE put out uh, looking at funding different types of solar investigations. The, uh, one of the key elements of DOE Sunshot is this is looking at research, at design work, but not installation. So that's one of the restrictions on the, uh, the grant programs is that none of the funds can be used for actual installation. As you kind of may have guessed from the first two speakers, you know, Illinois' solar industry is kind of a, a nascent market. It kind of means it's just about there, it's starting to get there, there's a lot of potential. Um, as of last year, 65 megawatts of installed non-utility uh, solar in Illinois compares to the 4,000 megawatts of non-utility solar in California. If you threw the utility solar in California on, that's, that would bring it up to over 13,000 megawatts. So as you can see, there's you know, a lot of potential. Um, as you indicated, you know, Illinois is kind of positioned uh, quite well for that possible growth. Again, I say possible because that's kind of what the Cook County application of solar uh, sunshot is going at. Next slide. So I'm going to read this part. But so the, the definition of the Cook County community solar project is unlocking the potential of community solar in Chicago region, expanding access and equity in distributed generation. It's a stakeholder-driven process. It's one of the, the keys. It'll demonstrate repl replicable models for community solar and develop five to seven demonstration pilot case studies. Again, all of this is 
using modeling, using estimations, because we can't actually go out and install the solar. Uh, the analysis includes opportunity assessments, best practices, economic and policy barrier resolutions, value proposition, and impact analysis. And it's this last few that we kind of really have, have discovered is where a lot of the uh, meat of the issues are. It's in that the, the policy side, the, the barriers, the, uh, the value proposition, because there's many, many different ways, as you saw, you know, the cash payments, the PPAs, the leases, coupling with batteries. You know, there's lots of different ways to try to make the economic model work. And a lot of that depends on the electric marketplace. And it's not as much always just the retail electric marketplace, the ComEd side of things, uh, but it's also that wholesale level. The, in ComEd's in the, in, in ComEd situation, that's the PJM, that's the transmission operator. They're the ones who are paying for that regulation services that batteries can provide. So it's a lot of different systems that you have to kind of uh, navigate. So the accomplishments um, from the Sunshot community, or the Cook County's uh, community solar, is stakeholder engagement. There's nearly 200 stakeholders that have been organized together to provide both a stakeholder advisory group, working groups, uh, technical experts. Uh, we've worked with uh, site owners also. You know, so we're trying to include in this analysis all the, the relevant parties, which includes the utilities. Uh, it's been a collaborative analytical process, so we've gotten work with consultants and uh, to work on bill crediting, economic policy barriers, resolutions, and value propositions. One of the key things we did was an opportunity assessment. When we say two million uh, properties were analyzed, that was with LIDAR data in the city of Chicago. So we actually got LIDAR data analyzed uh, 2 million rooftops. From that, about 44,000 looked to be suitable for solar. Uh, we built a website that allowed you to go on and look to see what the LIDAR results came for your, uh, your, profit, or your property. are working right now on this pilot development, so the utility rate structure, uh, business models, financial models. We've asked for sites to say they would like to participate in this. We were able to get them over 400 sites responded. We were able to whittle that down to about 109 that kind of qualified, and now we're whittling that down again to maybe around the 20 to 30. The mix is about 60% government, or 20% uh, profit, 20% non-profit. But I don't want to necessarily leave you with all um, positive sides, because there are challenges. Um, one of which is the fluid um, legislation. The uh, there is no enabling legislation for community solar. Uh, the, there was a uh, docket for the Illinois Commerce Commission that the Commerce Commission voted on and ruled that two things. One, that the utilities had to provide a written yes or no for each given community solar application. And two, the ICC said that the third party suppliers were the ones that were to be able to propose community solar. 
that passed the Commerce Commission and went to the JCAR, which is the Joint Committee on Administrative Rules in the legislature. They knocked down that second provision. So the only thing that came out of that docket with the ICC was now the utilities have to provide a written up or down and why community solar wouldn't work in a given location. Uh, we ended up having this LIDAR data, the GIS data. It was only for the city of Chicago. The Cook County Solar program was Cook County, but we weren't able to get that extra data. And again, the, uh, the valuation data is, is kind of a, one of the harder, more fluid uh, areas. But Cook County's Sunshine Program started last year in January, and we've moved now into the next phase, which is kind of taking these 30 or so uh, sites, whittling them down to anywhere from five to eight to actually do some preliminary uh, investigations as far as is it applicable? Will it work? What model, what economic model makes it work? And I will also be around for uh, any questions. Thanks. Thank you, Larry. So we've gotten a few examples from the private sector of, of projects on the ground that uh, private sector companies are leading the development of and engaging municipalities and community institutions. And we just heard from, from Larry uh, about a really collaboration between Cook County government and all the energy to, to go after federal funding to be able to support some of this assessment and analysis um, that would hopefully lay the foundation for the long-term solar development in Cook County. Um, and we're doing these presentations so that they're sort of uh, food for thought uh, during, our, during our discussion groups as we start to think about either existing initiatives that we can connect to or big idea projects that we may want to develop. I mean, Elevate Energy in Cook County teamed up to go after that federal money. It's a great example of a, of a, of a uh, government and nonprofit partnership to be able to support a specific initiative in this case around community solar. Um, so now it kind of leads us to the, the elephant in the room, uh, which is our, some of our policy barriers, barriers that have been um, really have been mentioned by a few of our presenters already. And we invited Jen Wallen, who's the uh, executive director of the Illinois Environmental Council. Jen's been in that role since 2011. In Jen's role, she's not only dealing with solar policy, but works really across the board. Um, among numerous different policy initiatives that, um, that cut across various sustainability topic areas. Jen has formerly worked for uh, Senator Heather Steens for the Environmental Law Policy Center, for SCARES, a local nonprofit uh, in DuPage County, and, uh, and is really recognized across the state of Illinois as a policy leader. Uh, please join me in welcoming Jen Waller. <laughs> um, I mean, and, and who knew, this is, this is not funny, but who knew there might be better odds for a Cubs World Series than the legislature doing its own job and having a budget, right? <laughs> so, a um, uh, very tough environment that we're in, and I am, I know that um, a lot of you here, who's heard of the Clean Power Plan? A lot of people here, who's heard of the Illinois Clean Jobs Bill? I'm, I'm happy there's like 10 more hands for that one, than there was for Clean Power Plan. So some of this I'm, I'm really going to read brief on because I think that what many of you here are going to be interested in is the current update on what's going on with these because we've been talking about these issues uh, for a couple of years now. But I, I, I want to start a little bit with stuff that's not in my slides here. And I know I've only got a short amount of time, but I'll be quick. And I just want to talk about, um, I know a lot of you hear about what's going on, that there's no state budget, that there's this budget in past, And I want to talk about how that affects energy issues. And so there's been quite a bit, uh, quite a few things, and we have on our website the numerous ways the budget in past affects the environment. But you know, you've got the late, the legislature last year took a hundred million dollars of renewable energy funds that are supposed to be used for 
um, the, the funding to purchase renewable energy. They took that, they swept it, they used it to pay for our basic services, basic schools, that sort of thing. And this comes out of, it's not just your tax dollars, this comes off of special uh, fees on your utility bills that are supposed to pay for these things that you've been promised that you're gonna pay and it's gonna go to these things and it's been moved and that's not what it's used for anymore. Um, we also have a situation where things like the Illinois Power Agency, which procures energy, including our renewable energy commitment, um, they have things like they haven't, they have contractors they haven't paid in 11 months, they have situations where solar companies apply to um, be offered our procurement, they pay a deposit, they can't keep paid that deposit back because uh, the, there's no appropriations for that. Um, many things that are happening with solar projects are really highly set back by what's going on with the Illinois Power Agency right now. Um, there's supposed to be a solar rebate that hasn't been used as a solar rebate in years. I am just painting you the picture of this disaster here, but it's just something to think about when you're talking to legislators. I know we hear a lot about the human services catastrophe, but there's a huge impact here and a huge impact on our energy. So hopefully as we pass this, a lot of these problems and how it interacts with the state budget will be solved. And um, I mean, it, it is all tied up together, so we're gonna have to figure those things out. But um, just, I know it's not a very bleak picture there, but hopefully this will be a little more positive than where we are right now. So um, just very briefly, at Lillian Environmental Council, we have about 70 different member organizations. We're sort of like the trade association for the environmental groups in Illinois, Sierra Club, Environmental Law Policy Center, um, all those organizations are on our board and we serve as their lobbyists in Springfield. Now many of groups, those groups have their own lobbyists, but we make sure everybody's working together, coordinated, and we work on a lot of big things or small things every year. So uh, I just want to go into, with the next part, a little bit about uh, the Clean Power Plan. And this was in uh, June of uh, 2014, this was when the Clean Power Plan was proposed. Um, and this, at this point, it's gotten to a point where the final rule has been uh, set forth and of course there is a stay at the Supreme Court that is going to take a while to resolve. So there is some pushback in the timeline of when the clean power plan might happen. Of course a lot of this happens on what, uh, it's gonna uh, depend on what administration is going to take over, but I think it's widely viewed in the business community, the environmental community, that this carbon regulation is inevitable. And with, what's, what's different with the Clean Power Plan, it falls under the uh, US EPA's authority under the Clean Air Act. And um, what's different about it is that before we have regulated what comes out of the smokestack, even in previous iterations, we've regulated carbon before, but it's been carbon from you know, new coal plants, so they've had to reduce the amount of carbon emissions that they're putting out through efficiency and other means. This Clean Power Plan is really regulating air emissions through looking at the grid, not necessarily what comes out of the smokestack. So I have got some numbers up here, 30, uh, okay, the 32% reduction in carbon emissions. And, uh, it's state by state. Illinois' plan is 31% reductions from 2030 levels. Um, and each state is different in what they have to put together. The federal government has really looked at the energy mix of each state, the policies that are in place, the costs, of different conversions and um, the carbon reductions that are needed to hit that goal and state by state. So a really unique approach. And then um, there's some building blocks down here. These have altered from the original, but I just suffer some ideas here of what um, would count. I mean, so there's um, uh, efficiency within a coal plant itself, the some that's there. In Illinois, there is not a whole lot that we can do with efficiency with coal plants. There are a number that will shut down, uh, but that uh, there's not a lot we can do with efficiency. There's fuel switching from coal to natural gas, which as environmentalists we are not into because um, natural gas has its own environmental problems, at least natural gas from fracking. Um, and so that's not something that we see. And in Illinois, we don't have a whole lot of infrastructure to convert um, a whole lot of plants to natural gas. We actually have very few other than for heater plants. Um, what we do have a lot of is nuclear power, and there is a section for renewables and nuclear accounting for that goal. Um, and of course, we have our own issues with nuclear power as well, um, but it's something that counts towards the clean power plant. And finally, energy efficiency is a huge segment as well, although less in the final goal than the most. So we're going to burn through some of these. Um, go ahead. Okay. So um, Illinois.
Illinois is very well suited to uh, meet the goal of the Clean Power Plan from some of the standards that we already have in place. So in 2007, in conjunction with other energy bills for um, you know, common for generation, we have the uh, Energy Efficiency Resource Standard and the Renewable Portfolio Standard. Now, I have the Energy Efficiency Resource Standard first because it's kind of been this quiet giant of um, huge economic growth and huge success, especially in the combat region for um, energy efficiency reduction. We've actually required the utilities to operate in a way where they're um, reducing the amount of energy that they're providing to certain customers. So uh, we have this goal of this 2% this decrease in demand after 2015. Um, that has been capped, so we don't quite need it. It's been more like 1.4%. And actually that, that cap, there's sort of, there's a cap on um, how much it costs the customer. So there's a rate cap on the energy efficiency standard, but energy efficiency actually saves people money. And it not only saves you money, it saves your neighbor that doesn't use it money because you don't have to build new infrastructure, et cetera. Um, and so we have a rate cap on saving energy um, that's supposedly for consumers. That's something we address later on. But then, um, you know, with the next portion, we also have the renewable portfolio standard and our standard being 25% by 2025 um, that we have on the books already. So those are those are some goals that we already have, and they've been huge. I mean, um, to give you an idea, uh, there's Clean Energy Trust, and with some other organizations did a job study, which actually will be later, but I'm gonna spoil it. Um, there are over 100,000 clean energy jobs in Illinois. That's more than the real estate and accounting sectors combined. And what you don't know, I mean, you look at renewable energy and you look at that and you see a lot of wind. There's, of course, a lot of untapped solar resource. You see a lot of wind all over. You think, oh, that's that's the biggest thing we're doing for clean energy here. But uh, of those 100,000 jobs, two thirds of them are in the energy efficiency sector. So there's just a lot going on there. There's a lot of economic development, a lot of job creation from this work. And it's been really great messaging to talk about the bill that we want to propose. Um, so I want to scroll down already to clean energy jobs. Um, but so that's been really good messaging for this bill that we're working on. And I know there was a lot of people in the room that raised their hands for the Illinois Clean Jobs Bill. Um, this is a bill that we introduced last year in 2015 that has several portions to it. So it's got um, renewable energy, and I think later on in this, I'm going to talk about very briefly the RPS fix. We have some, uh, 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 our RPS is broken, and we need to fix it uh, just in terms of the way policy interact. Um, but so uh, we, we fixed the RPS, expanded 35% by 2030. There's also portions in it that do explicitly allow community solar. They give credits for brownfield redevelopment for solar. Solar is great for brownfields because you can put it down, and if later on you decide that you want to uh, develop a community center on that brownfield, you can pretty easily pick up the solar and move it to another place. So brownfield redevelopment of solar um, is a very important portion of that. Low income solar, those are all in the bill that we put together. And with energy efficiency, we remove that rate cap that I talked about. We expand it, so instead of the 2% each year, it's a 20% by 2025 um, decrease in energy usage in Illinois. Um, and then that also expands different low income energy efficiency portions and other things as well. Uh, and then finally, putting together a carbon framework for Illinois. And our carbon framework, there's actually a lot of discussion about how this might be done. Um, with cap and trade, you have a lot of low income communities that are not supportive of cap and trade because often the trade means that the pollution all stays in certain hotspots or you can create new hotspots from the trading. Um, so our, uh, what we proposed is then stakeholder process to create a cap and invest system they would put a price on carbon and then use the proceeds from carbon to pay for things like renewable energy, energy efficiency, uh, job transition, job training, um, low income heating assistance. So all those sorts of things. So just a little bit about our bill and then I'll give you the update of where we're at. Um, the next one, uh, we can go in here. These are some of just the specifics and you want to look at um, the Illinois Clean Jobs Bill. Um, so a couple of things. Our bill is the from the Citizens Utility Board the most cost-effective way to meet the needs of the Clean Power Plan in Illinois. Um, COP has estimated that we've already saved a billion dollars from our policies and this would save another 1.6 billion 
billion dollars. Um, and the uh, Union of Concerned Scientists has a broader economic overview that includes a lot of extra net, uh, external costs that uh, puts the price tag at saving $12 billion uh, from renewable energy and energy efficiency and, and the economic development to the state of Illinois. So those are a couple of important measures, some of the stuff, and actually, uh, from this, I can transition into telling you a little bit about where it is right now. So, of course, we're not doing this Illinois Clean Jobs Bill in a vacuum. Um, there is a lot that other folks want to do with energy right now. And so, ComEd and Exelon um, both have, uh, last year, ComEd and Exelon both had introduced bills. Um, ComEd's bill had to do with um, their rate demand, uh, voltage optimization, and actually, What's interesting here is um, ComEd and Exelon both put into their bill a lot that had to do with renewable energy and energy efficiency. So ComEd had a lot with uh, voltage optimization and energy efficiency. Exelon's bill had to do with keeping some of its not um, <coughs> less profitable nuclear plants open. And so there's a couple of plants that under the capacity auction would be uh, losing some money each year. So uh, Exelon's bill would, um, they called it, now it was before called the Low Carbon Portfolio Standard, but it's fascinating that both of these bills centered around energy efficiency and some clean energy, even if they were bills that we have proposed. So we really are taking the narrative there and um, taking the narrative with our, our jobs message as well, which, uh, the next one, um, the Illinois uh, Science and Technology Institute did a study and found that this, our, our bill would create 32,000 jobs in Illinois. So in addition to those jobs that we already talked about, um, this is what would happen with this bill. So where it's at now, Comet and Exelon have teamed up and introduced another bill, uh, which they're calling the Next Generation Energy Plan, and it's no longer a low carbon portfolio standard, it's a zero emission standard um, that they put together for Illinois. It's still a bill that we have a lot of problems with, for one thing, Ameren is not included in any of the energy efficiency, which for you guys might not make a difference, but it's two-thirds of the state that would be losing out on jobs and economic opportunity from energy efficiency. What they do to solar is just confusing. Um, there's, it, it, what they proposed in it, it's a lot that affects solar. They, oppose, they proposed basically getting rid of or grandfathering net metering and replacing it with an upfront rebate, which could be okay. Um, but you, know, you have to look at it overall, especially because they're proposing this demand rate charge, um, and the demand rate charges basically lock you into a certain um, cost, no matter what energy you use. Um, and there's a lot of concerns with that overall, but the demand rate charges could be really, um, have a lot of consequences on solar that are very negative. And so those three policies together, and then, um, uh, there are other things in it, like they go back to being able to own gas turbines and we've really got to come out of owning energy. So there are a lot of problems still with what's been proposed for the next generation energy plan, but we're kind of in this situation where we have over half the legislature sponsoring our bill, a lot of people in the area are sponsoring the bill, um, we have a lot of support with what we want to do, but Common and Exelon want these things, and I think we're at a point where we can't pass our bill without them, and they can't pass their bill without us. So having discussions about how can we proceed together, um, and how can we minimize the things that they might want in a comprehensive energy package, and maximize the thing that we want, um, those have been the discussions that have taken place. And I can tell you, you know, there's been a lot of reports in the media about it now, so I can be a little more open than I was a couple of months ago, but um, with energy efficiency, they got us very close you know, these discussions are going really well. ComEd sees itself as the utility of the future and sees energy efficiency being really important. Um, on renewable portfolio standards, what was proposed in their bill was just, uh, a, they, they had a two-page drafting error, error where they cut out the RPS, for example. There's a drafting error that's back in. Um, and uh, in, in discussions, we've gotten a lot closer on fully fixing the RPS. Um, which we have to weigh all of the policies that might be in place as well because um, some of that might help win, but it might be problematic for some solar companies and it's still uh, 
weighing all the different policies together is going to take time, so we weren't able to complete it before May 31st. And I also think rate demand charges and money for Exelon are going to be a tough thing for the legislature to fight on, especially when they um, have no budget in place. And so I, just my predictions, which you can't quote me on, but my predictions, I, I think that this is something we'll keep having ongoing discussions about, but I see an energy package happening after an election, um, just because of what, what costs might be in there. But it could be wrong, it could be poor, it could be uh, you know, 2017, but there is an urgent need to get the energy discussion moving and going, and uh, I think we've done a great job of pitching it in a way where you know, we're talking about jobs, and of course there's environmental benefit to it, but um, our bill is both the cheapest way to comply and the um, best thing for, for the economy in the state. So that's uh, my positive message there, that I think things are going well despite it taking this long. Some of the biggest things do. So I think, uh, yes, this is House sponsors, which we have 62 of, and then the next one was Senate sponsors. I, I think out here, um, Linda Holmes is a sponsor, and just in the Fox Valley region in general, um, Steve Anderson and Anna Moeller have been really great sponsors. Like, basically everybody, I mean, there's there's a few of that have not gotten on. Yes, yeah, so, who am I missing? Who that? Stephanie Kippen was a sponsor, Anna Moeller from Elkin. Uh, yeah. In fact, you could say that everyone in the Fox Valley, well, Mr. Oberweiss is not a sponsor. Yes, Mr. Mr. Oberweiss is not a sponsor. And uh, Linda Temple is not a sponsor. Yes, yeah, she's not. So, um, so these are, are yeah. And, and Linda and Frank from the Sierra Club have been really great volunteers in helping us get this done. But uh, just really quick, uh, you know, and this is, uh, it's been bipartisan as well. These are three legislators. Um, County, but Mike Gordner, Ron Zandek, and Mike Tryon, who's McHenry County, all wrote an op-ed in support of this bill. So, you know, this is not just a one, you know, like a Democratic initiative and bipartisan huge support from one people. So, I love to use my contact info, and I'm only be around for a little bit, but that is my email and phone if anybody has any questions. So, thank you so much for having me out here today. So, thank On behalf of everyone, thanks for uh, putting your, your head in the fight in Springfield on a daily basis. Jen works extremely hard, and it's not an easy task to deal with the state of Illinois legislature. Uh, so, Jen, <laughs> before you leave, we want to make sure that in the small group, uh, we have a few marching orders uh, for things that uh, everyone can do to help support the uh, Illinois Clean Jobs Bill. Uh, so, thank you. All right, so that leads us to our discussion time. We're going to go to uh, just about five of five. Um, so we can have uh, very, very brief report facts and then some uh, next step marching orders. Um, and essentially, we have facilitators in each of seven topic areas. You see the name, tag, uh, name cards on each of your tables. The facilitators will uh, give you the instructions for what we're going to do. Uh, so I'm not going to go into the detail on that. So if you can just now. Take your time to uh, go to the table that you'd like to be in a discussion group on, and uh, and we'll talk until about five or uh, four fifty-five. Thank you. Okay. So we're